Please won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. I read this once from an anonymous Christian. When my son was about five years old, we went into a Catholic church where the smell of incense hung in the air. We were Protestants at the time. The priest came out and was talking with us about the beautiful church. My son was sniffing the air and smiling. The priest asked him what he thought of the church. It smells holy, he replied. The priest asked him what his church smelled like. Coffee was his answer. <laughs> to me, coffee smells like God, too. And not just because it consists of magic beans that turn into a warm, comforting liquid, helping me to refrain from selling the children on Craigslist every single morning, but because the smell of coffee <laughs> reminds me of preparing a place in God's house for all. It reminds me of gathering in love and hospitality, of caviar conversations here at this church and connections with people, which is the way that I know Christ. In Haiti, there's an expression in Creole that says, cooked food has no owner. This is the world through Jesus's eyes, a sense that all of it comes from God and none of it belongs to anyone. This is Jesus's mindset, a spirit of abundance and sharing and welcome. I would like to say this morning that this is not a Christian country. And I don't say that because the church is dying or because we did away with prayer in schools, like some pastors might say, or because we are a melting pot for all cultures and faiths, although all of those things are true. This is not a Christian country because our collective mindset is broke not just about money and resources, but also about love and welcome. We are cheapskates with all of it. To be broke-minded or to have a broke mindset means to live your life with the constant fear and acknowledgement that you don't have enough or that you will run out of something. This usually correlates to how you make and spend your money but even deeper than that lies a fundamental fear of loss and being without. Broke mindset causes hoarding instead of sharing. Broke mindset means collecting weapons of war to protect yourself and your stuff. Broke mindset causes you to see your neighbor not as a child of the same God, but as competition for resources. Broke mindset dehumanizes immigrants and refugees Broke mindset makes us believe that there is never enough money, never enough food, never enough resources, never enough love. This country has a broke mindset. The politicians and billionaires of the world love that we have a broke mindset because it keeps us fighting against each other instead of finding power in numbers. A scarcity mindset limits our dreams and the people in charge don't want us dreaming. It keeps us trying and, and failing to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps rather than helping to lift others up out of poverty. It ensures that we see homeless children as drains on our paychecks and to rank and order who is most important to us and to God. No wonder our politicians are deeply cynical and fear-mongering and none of us are immune to broke mindset because it is part of our culture. Even here at this church, me too. Hashtag me too. I often find myself in discussion about the unfairness of grace. As someone who runs an organization that gives a lot of money and food away, I often find myself in prudent conversations about how to decide who is the deserving poor. That's broke mindset. The diaconate gets a request for money for hotel room or gas, and we discuss together whether they are telling the truth or if they are trying to take advantage of us. That is broke mindset. 
Many of us boast about giving food instead of money to the homeless, worried that they will buy drugs with it. I would argue that that's broke mindset. We say things on the internet like, share this if you believe homeless veterans deserve help before refugees. That's broke mindset. We all deserve help. We have appointed ourselves the judges of who is worthy of food, who is worthy of a home, who is worthy of money, who is worthy of this country, who is welcome at our table. America first, some Christians claim. America first is what it sounds like to worship a flag instead of Jesus. It's broke mindset. Love doesn't ask us to choose. The thing about God's grace, Jesus teaches us, is that it's limitless. Deciding who is worthy of grace is way beyond our job description. The thing about God's love is it doesn't run out, as my friend Kristen Turner likes to remind us here in church. So Jesus says we don't have to choose between refugees and homeless veterans. We don't have to choose between Democrats and Republicans. We don't have to choose between our children and other people's children. We don't have to choose between black lives and police officer lives. We don't have to choose between America and Ukraine. We don't have to choose between drug addicts and the deserving poor. We don't have to choose between the right and the left. We don't have to choose between legal immigrants or undocumented immigrants. We don't don't have to choose between the sick and the healthy, the rich and the poor. We don't have to choose between Christians or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists or atheists. We don't have to choose between straight people, gay people, trans or cisgender people. We don't have to choose. That's God's economy. Love doesn't run out. Love never ends. Love goes on. Love is always enough. Love wins. People who tell you otherwise are trying to sell you on a broke mindset, not on Jesus Christ. In our text from Matthew, Jesus had already privately warned his disciples of the end of the world in the, in the verses beforehand. He says that there will be dark days ahead and that he is seated on the throne and now called king. And naming Jesus king, calling Jesus Lord, is nothing short of revolutionary, because he is the opposite of our worldly kings. And in this particular portrait of Christ the king in this chapter of Matthew, he's a little bit scary. First, he says that all nations of the world have gathered before him and praised him as king. And then Jesus says he will return and start separating the sheep and the goats, the blessed and the damned. And I left that part out of our reading today because I don't like it. I don't. I'm just being honest. <laughs> but that is what gets us to the passage that we read today. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, he says. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And how do we know who is who? The blessed ones, he says, have demonstrated their faithfulness by loving other human beings without deciding who is worthy of that love. They take care of the poor and disadvantaged. They welcome the refugees. They heal the sick. They welcome the despised and the disabled. They give food to the hungry. They give water to the thirsty. They hang out with the wrong crowd. They love people without judging who is worthy of it, just as Jesus did in his ministry on earth. Do likewise, he said. And that's all he said. The service to the least of these concerns all people everywhere. It is a reminder that our God is a God of extravagant, wasteful grace. Unearned, unmerited, unrestrained, unconditional, unbroke love. A church that ditches broke mindset and gets expensive with its love instead. 
a church that welcomes all and feeds as many as possible, who gives its money away without strings attached, that is a church worthy of the kingdom of God, a church that will grow abundantly. And it is not easy to ditch that mindset, but it's what Jesus calls us to do. So people often ask about the point of church growth. We talked about growth in our um, all MLT meeting, all, our all ministry leadership team meeting this week. We talked about, is it growth for growth's sakes, for growth's sake? When we grow, we don't know everyone anymore. Do we want to grow simply because we need revenue sources for our budget? Isn't there a limit to how much we can grow when the return on investment starts to slip? Is there a magic number that we will be satisfied at? And I told them that the answer is absolutely not, because we do not grow for growth's sake. We do not grow to feed the pastor's ego. We do not grow because we look at humans and see dollar signs circling their heads. We grow because this is not a closed social club. Amen? <laughs> this is a house of God and a house for all nations, and a house for all sinners and saints, and a house for all, all. God reminds us that strangers are a piece of us that we do not yet know. Our reason for our very existence is growth. It's to welcome the stranger, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give good news to the poor. The more people, the more ways to know God. The more diverse, the more like God's kingdom. The more open to the least of these, the more open to Jesus. A church that is not growing is dying. Dying in number, dying in soul and most importantly, dying to our very mission to gather in the spirit of Jesus and create heaven on earth. I had a coffee with the pastor this past Sunday and one of our new people, she's here today, I'm gonna call her out, Sincere. <laughs> she told me that she brings different friends, different family members and different neighbors with her every week. And it's true, she does. She is like the best evangelist for First Church ever. And she just got here like, I don't know, a year ago, is that right? Less than a year ago. And she said that it's hard for her to get out of, the bed, uh, get out of bed early on Sunday morning. However, when she is bringing a friend to church, she makes sure that they get here before 10 o'clock and plenty of time for the welcome statement that I say at the beginning I get a little sick of saying this welcome statement. I've been saying it every Sunday for 10 years. My kids make fun of me. They like copy it. They, they sit in the front row and they like mock me the entire time. <laughs> so it's good to hear this from Sinceri that that welcome statement matters. She, she says that she wants her friends to know that we are that kind of church. She wants them to feel and know how welcome they are. Almost everyone that comes to coffee with the pastor, gay and straight, say that they come because they were looking for an open and affirming church, First Church in Sterling. Aren't you glad that you became open and affirming in 2017? That's why people are coming through your doors, straight people too. One, a church whose, uh, whose welcome is as wide as God's love is what people are looking for. This is our religion. Once I asked a child in our Sunday school what we believe, and she said, well, I think we believe that everyone is welcome. That's what we believe. And when you ask kids in confirmation what we believe as a church, they don't recite our covenant, they don't recite the Lord's Prayer. Instead, they recite that welcome statement that they've all memorized. When a, uh, when a confirm man last year wrote his credo, he included our, our entire welcome statement as his faith statement. I think that if the one thing our kids learn about Jesus is that God's house is big enough for all of humanity to fit in, that there's room for all of God's children at that communion table, that people of all towns and cities and states and countries of all ages, races, nationalities, abilities, sexualities and gender expressions of all shapes and sizes, of all beliefs and non-beliefs, of all faiths even, I think if the one thing our kids learn is that there is always plenty to eat and drink and no one is turned away, then 
and that's all they really need to know about Jesus. That's all they really need to know about God's economy. Abundance, not scarcity. At our best, welcome is our religion. Feeding and clothing and housing people is our religion. Diversity is our religion. Non-judgment is our religion. Welcoming the stranger and the immigrant and refugee and the outcast is our religion. Our religion is grace. Because we are followers of Christ, we are rich, not broke growing, not dying, loving, not judging. Dr. Jackie Lewis says, the first time I took communion, my mother gave me bread and said, this means that God will always love you. And then she gave me the juice and she said, this means that God will never leave you. The heart of the gospel. You are beloved. You belong. You are never alone. The heart of the gospel says that this extravagant, wasteful love is for everyone, the whole world. So on this World Communion Day, it is important to remember that this love extends to all nations. Prepare a place at your table, like Debbie did, for the refugee, for the homeless vet, for the stockbroker, and the child on food stamps. You don't have to choose. Love doesn't run out. You are beloved. You belong. And you are never alone. Amen.